Hi, it's Jamie with UK Extension, and today I want to talk about crepe myrtles. Obviously, crepe myrtles are a non-native landscape choice, but they're extremely popular for late summer color. There's not a lot of flowering happening in late summer, so these are especially valuable for that. And this is a beautiful example. This is one of my favorites. This is a variety called Pink Velour. We'll talk about a few other ones that I consider to be better, more hardy ones for our climate. But let's talk about crepe myrtles in general. First of all, crepe myrtles like actually, well, they can grow in a variety of things, but to optimize the winter hardiness, there is an authority on crepe myrtles, uh, probably retired now, but used to be at the University of Oklahoma, I believe, named Carl Whitcomb. Well, Carl Whitcomb actually has several crepe myrtle introductions to his credit. He was one of the more recent people, and now everybody's on the crepe myrtle bandwagon, but he probably did a lot of work, his work in the 70s and 80s. But this is uh, pink velour. I really like it. The foliage is really dark in the spring, and that deeper foliage makes it pop has excellent fall color. Pay attention to what your crepe myrtle color is in the fall because they can be some of the most spectacular fall color shrubs. This is a good one. I normally get reds and oranges and things. Uh, and I love this color, of course, as well. So it's blooming a little bit later. I pruned this this year. What you need to be aware of is because here in Kentucky, we're kind of pushing the northern hardiness of crepe myrtles. There's more cultivars now that perform well in zone six than there were many years ago. And there's also great ones from the crepe myrtle breeding program at the um, USDA Arboretum. Uh, some of those were Indian names. They came 20 years before these. And that would be things like Kiowa, Tonto, um, Toronto, Muskegee, Sioux, Cherokee, all of those are still in the market. Many of those are really good varieties, often large varieties. This one's a little more compact and I'm not sure what it would do in the south. I've had it for about 10 years. It has withstood a 25 below winter without dying to the ground, which was shocking. Let's talk back to Mr. Whitcomb, or he or some noted authority, I once heard quoted as saying, if you want to promote winter hardiness in crepe myrtle, do three things. After they're planted and established, you know, you've got to water them to get them initially going. Once a crepe myrtle is established, to promote the maximum amount of winter hardiness, you never feed, you never water, and you never prune. So those three things equate to slower growth, and slower growth is normally a little more a little tougher, thicker cell walls and stuff than when we're pushing things to grow real quickly. And all of those practices promote lush growth that is more sensitive to winter damage. Another thing is pruning. In the winter time, many of the less hardy cultivars or in a really severe winter or exposed location, lots of crepe myrtles will go to the ground. I mean, like die back like a large perennial. This can occur every year on some of the more tender things, or it usually occurs every five to 10 years when we get mild winters and then have a dip in our winter temperatures uh, sort of unexpectedly or out of the pattern. That'll fry a lot of crepe myrtles. If they freeze to the ground, they come back and they will often flower, particularly these newer ones that flower more on new wood or buds from new wood. So if you have to prune, if they get frozen, that's in inevitable. However, do we have to prune as a matter of practice? Well, I do some because I grow these as huge perennials and I do it for the color when there's not a lot blooming in the perennial garden, mix them into shrub borders and things. I have 20 or 30 that I really love in all colors. There are crepe myrtles in pinks, whites, reds, purples, lavenders, and that's probably the bulk of the color spectrum. So lots of options to choose from many, many colors, but do your research as we always tell you to do. So those are some tips. Crepe myrtles are gonna always be happiest in full baking sun. They don't have to have the richest soil, but um, they prefer a decent soil like everything else. A few other cultivars I wanna mention, and we'll um, show you some photos of these. 
Dynamite and Red Rocket are very similar to each other. One of them is a little more upright growth habit and where I prune a little each year, I know that's not absolutely desirable to promote winter hardiness, but I'm not trying to grow crepe myrtle trees. Let me share with you those crepe myrtle trees we see in the south, kind of a pipe dream in our area. We get winters that knock them back. I have seen a few examples that survived, a white variety that survived 25 below and did not freeze to the ground and kept its tree form. That particular one's been around for years. It's part of that USDA program that I mentioned and has the uh, Indian tribe name of, I'm going to tell you the wrong name. I'm going to drop in a caption with that because it just went out the other side of my head. But there is a white one. I'll get the name back before we finish this video. But seed heads, you let those develop. Crepe myrtles will come up from seed occasionally. It's not real common, but you'll occasionally get seedlings. You can tip those off. Deadheading, which is just removing the spent blooms and seed heads, is not does not constitute a hard pruning that would cause the hardiness issues we talked about. They're generally pretty pest free. Once established, they're extremely tough, durable, and drought tolerant. The one biggest pest we deal with on crepe myrtle is Japanese beetle, which can really make one look very unsightly. They don't pose a risk to the health of the plant, but you strip the foliage and make it all nasty and you get them eating the blooms, it's not great. And sometimes that pruning or freezing will delay the flowering, push it a little later in summer till we miss the Japanese beetle window altogether. That's what happened here. This one was hardly even showing a bloom when the beetles were here. And some of them I'm noticing, I haven't found published information about this or research, but it is apparent to me that there's a lot of variation in how long they take to flower from being cut back in the spring. Some of them are quick to respond, some are not. And also, similarly, there are some varieties that just don't seem to be fed on by Japanese beetles. I wish I had documented this for the 10 years or so I've had all these crepe myrtles. Just to give you a list of good ones, I don't have that. It may be out there from some other university. But crepe myrtles are a just absolutely can't be without, in my opinion, late summer flowering shrub or small tree as you go further south. Um, and in the deep south, yes, you can find 30 and 40 foot crepe myrtles. There are also a lot of dwarf forms on the market now. And things that don't require pruning make more sense than planting a 40 foot crepe myrtle and chopping it mercil myrtle mercilessly every year. So look for small ones, look for winter hardy ones, look for ones with good fall color. I'm not sure you can find information on whether or not they get Japanese beetle badly. This is one of the better ones that I grow, I can tell you that much. And often that's weird because often dark foliage stuff is more appealing to Japanese beetle. And who knows, next year it may be a fluke, next year this may be stripped and the other's all fine. But uh, back to that list of good ones. A really small compact purple that I love, and it's a good deep grape purple, is a newer one in the Magic series, and I'm wanting to say Michael Durr was involved in the introduction of those, but he may have another line. I know the Razzle Dazzle series is his breeding. I'm not quite sure about the other. but. Um, Purple Magic is an excellent one. I also grow Coral Magic, which is a real pretty corally pink shade in a very small plant. Some of the Magic series, I think it's Plum Magic or one of the others, has beautiful black foliage, which I'm very fond of, but it has never flowered for me. It freezes so hard and is so late, often July or August, even coming out of the ground. That's an example of one that's just too far north, in my opinion. So lots of neat things about crepe myrtles, a few downsides, the seedlings, the freezing, that sort of stuff. But it's all about knowing what to expect. Having a crepe myrtle that freezes to the ground and still flowers every summer at six or eight feet, or having one that gets to 15 that you know you can chop every five years and be okay, that's also acceptable. But it always makes sense when selecting any plant to do the extra mile and research the plant. If you need a small crepe myrtle for a small spot, it would be foolish to buy a 40 footer. Similarly, if you need a bigger one, choose accordingly. The market is increasingly having lots of smaller varieties. Some of the newer stuff is not really tried and proven, so it's kind of buy it on an experimental basis. But um, we're learning more every year about which ones work, which ones don't. And there are some good ones for Kentucky, even though they may not ever be the giant single trunk trees we covet that we see in our trips to the south.